Okay, now we'll be talking about GCMs. And GCMs are typically called these days global climate models. And these are comprehensive global climate models. And I'll say a little more about what that means in a minute. But first I want to also mention that this is an example of a backronym which is a reverse acronym because this used to mean a generalized circulation model. And that's where the acronym GCM came from, but then it was sort of retrofitted to mean global climate model. Anyways, what is a GCM? A GCM is our most sophisticated representation of the global climate system. And in this video I'll try and explain to you how it works and then in the next video we'll talk about what we use it for. Okay, so let's start with our globe and let's put an approximate land surface in here. So a GCM takes the globe and partitions it into lots and lots of little grid boxes so and there is horizontal and vertical grids so i'm going to try and illustrate this here visually so what i've represented here so far are essentially the atmospheric cells grid cells of our model and they are overlaid over the land surface and a modern GCM, sort of state-of-the-art, what we use currently in the most sophisticated research groups has about 1440 cells in the longitudinal direction which corresponds to about a quarter grid horizontal resolution and about 1,070 cells in the latitudinal direction, which on average corresponds also to around 0.2 degrees. And then you have vertical resolution. And so these vertical layers have around 50 layers in the atmosphere and in the ocean, approximately. So this is the first component of what I've drawn here, is our atmospheric model grid. And then we, of course, also have ocean and land grids. So we've established the setup of a model. Now what do we actually do in every one of these grid boxes? Well, we'll solve the primitive equations of fluid motion. What are the primitive equations? And we've talked about this briefly in the previous video. The continuity equation, which represents conservation of mass, the conservation of momentum, and a thermal energy equation. And this constitutes the core, the dynamic core of a global climate model. But of course, the climate system is way more complex than just that. And so there's a whole number of physical processes that we have to represent essentially at every grid box. So graphically, rather than talking about these equations, you have all these physical processes. So let's consider sort of a cross-section here. You have land ocean, so you have advection up and down in the ocean, and also mixing, and these are all things that you are solving with, with the equations that I've discussed up here. And then you have your atmosphere, of course, which also has advection and mixing. And then you have heat exchanges between different layers 
of your model, but also between the ocean and the atmosphere. You have exchange of moisture or water. And of course, momentum. You have what we were talking about previously, solar radiation and outgoing long wave radiation. You have clouds and snow and rain, sea ice. So all of these processes are represented on your model grid. Now you can imagine that some of these processes have large dynamic footprint, meaning the resolution of a quarter degree is very capable of, of representing large eddies and um, currents or wind patterns. But you also have small processes like small mixing and uh, high resolution turbulence. So those processes you would call subgrid scale processes. And that is one of the main challenges of climate modeling is how can you represent these processes in a climate model that has a finite grid size. And the way you do that is you come up with so-called parameterizations. And here the idea is that you don't actually solve for the individual fluid dynamics within the grid cell, but you come up with average numbers uh, that are important for the dynamics of the greater system. So you come up with certain parameters for processes like convection, albedo, hydrology, or clouds, just to name a few. And so what a GCM does, it takes all of these equations that I've described here, and it enforces certain boundary conditions like land conditions and bathymetry conditions. And then it takes these equations and integrates them over time. So it evolves the whole system over time and that allows us to also project into the future. And these are therefore our best instruments that we have to project what the future of the climate will look like.